Well, I think parliamentary review does something very interesting. It, it provides a, a platform for people to share and express their views, and I hope we're going to be able to build on that even more so that people can interconnect with each other. But it also gives an opportunity for parliamentarians to know that people are taking interest in what they're doing and how they're doing it. Hello and welcome to the Parliamentary Review podcast, the podcast that puts leadership in the spotlight. I'm Jonathan White and in each episode we'll be discussing the political and economic goings on in the country with directors, CEOs, CFOs, government ministers, chairmen, presidents, maybe one day even the Pope. Our aim is to discover who these people are, the people who get up each morning and make Britain work. We learn about the sleepless nights, the boardroom fights, and of course, the innovation and success that makes it all worthwhile in the end. Later on in this episode, you'll have the chance to hear our exclusive interview with Lord Blunkett, former Home Secretary, former Education Secretary, and of course, the co-chairman of the Parliamentary Review. But first, we're joined now by Colin Lowe, Managing Director of King's Fleet Wealth, who provide financial advice and wealth management. With clients based all over the country, King's Fleet maintain though their roots in Ipswich. Founded in 2010, which as years go, not one where financiers were particularly popular, the firm has grown both in terms of staff and profits. Colin, thank you for joining us today. That's an absolute pleasure. Well, I think it might be worthwhile beginning. Uh, perhaps an update on what King's Fleet's been doing since oh, well, pub- publication in September. Yeah, well, we've, we're, nothing ever goes quiet, um, <laughs> so we've been kept occupied and kept busy. Uh, naturally, there has been a slight hiatus at the beginning of the year as there was a little bit of concern out there about Brexit, and that right. may be something we want to come back to. I think we might um, have to. But, uh, I think, <laughs> yes. but I think probably since then there's been a little bit more momentum come back into the market, and we're having people who perhaps had put off um, making decisions, coming back to seek advice, and uh, yeah, we've been kept pretty busy. Uh, fantastic, and I, uh, and, um, I think uh, more uh, specifically about the business, it's founded in 2010, as I mentioned, um, certainly a time where uh, there was a reputation uh, for the sector. Uh, is that something you found particularly challenging in setting up uh, your reputation and getting the trust you now have? Yeah, I think it was, and it was something I was very aware of when we started the business, that we wanted to be different. And now, of course, I suppose everybody says that, but we really just had a focus on wanting to work with other professionals and demonstrating that we held skills and knowledge and qualification as being very important, and we'd invested in that. Um, so as a result, we, we've worked um, almost exclusively with accountants and solicitors who send people in our direction to work with. Um, and that's really because we are focused on this uh, professionalism aspect of demonstrating that actually we have the client front and centre of every thought and every recommendation that we make. And I think uh, that that trust aspect is exceptionally important, no matter what you do. Um, But when it comes to people's uh, money, obviously it perhaps matters even more. Um, And I think not only have you developed clearly the relationship between yourself and your clients, but a real relationship between yourselves and the local community. Um, I think I'm right in saying, I do correct if I'm wrong, but the the firm is actually named after your primary school, if that's right. Yes, absolutely. So there's sort of two strands to the whole education piece. So yes, um, Kingsley was the primary school that I went to. I grew up in a seaside town in Suffolk called Felixstowe. And uh, there are are really two reasons why education is important. One is that it is educating people on their finances, which pays our bills, that our qualifications, knowledge and experience are things that we charge for. The second is our community and social purpose, which is that we look to try and promote financial knowledge and education as a whole within this area. Um, Suffolk is an area that regrettably has not got the the greatest educational resource and yet I'm very aware that I do what I do and my team do what they do because of the education that we have both benefited from and made the most of. 
and we really want others in the community and within Suffolk as a whole to uh, to make the most of the skill set that they have. I think you couldn't be more right, and perhaps, and, and you agree or disagree with me if necessary, but um, that that education obviously has to start at you know, perhaps at an increasingly young age. Um, and given uh, what you do uh, on a day-to-day basis, there is, I know, perhaps a bit con- bit of concern that in the schools there are there is perhaps a lack of um, awareness and a, a, a false education in terms of kids learning um, the very basics of, of personal finances. Uh, is that reflected? Do you think uh, at your side of things? Oh, I, t- I totally agree. Um, financial education really is pretty woeful. Um, and, and and probably has always been, actually. Um, it really has never been very good in this country. And uh, you have to say that probably many of the issues that we see in personal finance and the difficulties, particularly with debt, are simply down to people not understanding how things work. Um, and, and they're left to pick up the pieces. So the economy benefits from people borrowing because it means they go and spend money, but it's spending money they don't have buying things they don't like um, often, mm. yes. <laughs> or often things they don't need. Um, so it's, it's, it's a frustration to me that we don't communicate well enough this knowledge that many of us have we are the financial services capital of the world, yes. and yet, actually, the populace as a whole is just very poorly educated about money, and that's a real shame. I, I think it was only uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, I think the TUC reported that the average um, household debt in the UK is now £15,500. Mm. And, you know, that, for a lot of people, that, that's, a, that's an alarming headline. It, it certainly is. And, and you know, back in the day when I was uh, when I worked in banking, I was trained to uh, I was regionally trained to to go out and communicate with schools about the the, the um, importance of budgeting, the importance of understanding how a credit card works, and if you don't make the payment off in one month, you've got a bigger bill to pay the following month. And, and these are things that I just think as as a sector. We're just not yet grasping. We're starting to make inroads, but there's so much more that we can do. Um, without a doubt, and you know, I think the review has always been about um, uh, uh, raising standards, um, and without putting you on the spot, Colin. But I suppose is there is there a good example, perhaps, in the last uh, couple of years, where you can point at uh, Kingsfleet that have um, that have done that within the sector? Well, uh, yeah. So we've we've tried to sponsor um, activities locally, not where we can just sponsor a golf day or or, or a, a music um, recital or something. All of those things are important, but we've tried to sponsor activities which have an impact in local schools. Um, and the main reason being that we want to be able to get people used to our name, but more importantly, we want local school children to benefit from getting further education or additional education, and particularly when it comes to money. So, yeah, we are really trying to, to, to use the resources that we have to spend our money wisely to try and promote this issue. Well, and I, I think it's fair to say um, that uh, you're, all of you there at Kingsley, it, it, it's a fairly uh, philanthropic organisation. Uh, I know you do a lot of work in the local community. Um, uh, anything recent that you want to talk about? Yeah, well, um, one of our big events we, we've been involved in for, I think it's five years now, is again, Felix Doe, where I grew up, um, started a wonderful book festival a few years ago. And I have to confess and thought, this isn't going to last. How is there going to be sufficient response and demand? But that's grown and grown and grown. They've got some really high profile authors involved now. And uh, yeah, that's something that we have really moved up. And uh, we're now a gold sponsor. So we uh, we sponsor more things than others but there's there's two main reasons we do that one is yes of course it's related to profile and it's being related to to the area in which i grew up and, and suffolk as a whole but the second thing is again the community work that they do of working with local primary schools and high schools to, to uh, bring people the joy of learning of, of opening a book and uh, and, and again something that i, I fear we have a, a generation that may not get the full benefit from but perhaps those of us have done in the past
Uh, and I think it's obviously so important that um, organisations like yourselves can can uh, uh, can sponsor that because w without sounding uh, ridiculous, I think people's imaginations can extend to uh, you know, Cheltenham having a book festival, hey, having a book festival, but the Port of Felix Day naturally uh, it doesn't perhaps uh, uh, you'll, yeah, you know, you'll, and, uh, it's it's fantastic that that's going well. Um, You'll, you'll have to come and join us. Come and uh, have a look. Well, I look for, I'll have to learn to read first, but I know I look, I look forward to it. Um, when, when, when's it on well, next? Just, just on that, one of the things that I'm really obsessed by, I don't, don't know if you've seen this, but, but I'm, I really notice it now. When you walk around towns where there's a Victorian era presence, how many water um, fountains there are. And I always think those water fountains were put there by successful business people for the benefit of those who didn't have clean water to drink. And I just think that phil philanthropy from the Victorian times is a lesson to all of us, that, that we all have a part to play if we have successful businesses to do something beneficial for the community in which we're, we're living. Uh, without a doubt. And I think it's, it's, it's an honourable message that I, I think really has been forgotten about. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. I think you, you can march around most of um, Britain's uh, county towns and there will be the, uh, uh, the, the marks of, of Victorian businessmen. And it's a wonderful thing to see. And perhaps and hopefully in 100 years time, they'll be saying the same thing about um, our current Elizabethan businessmen. Um, but I you, hope so. Let's, let's, uh, now, the next, looking forward, though, Colin, uh, what's the, what does the business have planned for the next 12 months? Well, we, we've been really privileged to just see ever since the business started nine years ago, an, an organic growth. Um, we've spoken to other businesses about acquisition and so on, and nothing's really come together. But we're just really privileged that we continue to have people coming to darken our doors and ask for advice. So what we're looking to do is to promote people from within to develop their skill set, to help them with further qualification so that they can move on to an advising position. And we've got two particular members of staff who are prepared for that, one in the next few weeks, uh, another one early in 2020. Um, and then what we're then doing as they progress, then filling extra staff from beneath. Um, so it's quite an exciting time for us as a business. Uh, and we, we're also looking to increase our footprint in other um, sites within Suffolk so that we have a more local presence within those areas. Um, so yeah, there's lots for us to do. We never stop planning. That's superb. I think I, whether you like it or not, I'm afraid I think we're going to have to come back in another 12 months and, and uh, go over that because um, it does sound exceptionally exciting. Um, but uh, look, moving on, uh, you know, perhaps looking at the sector more broadly, you've already mentioned it and I'm afraid inevitably it was going to come up. Um, the issue of Brexit has, as you've already said, it has caused a degree of uncertainty um, when people in, with people investing their money. Um, yeah. How, in a bit more detail than earlier, how have you found the situation? Yeah, so I suppose probably to the end, uh, probably October, November last year, we saw no change in people's thinking whatsoever. This is a broad generalisation, of course. Of course. Um, we didn't really feel that there was any negative reaction. People were simply carrying on as they were. And then really between, I would say, December and probably February, we saw a very different mindset arise where people who didn't need to make a decision chose not to. So they deferred making decisions. And that was really very noticeable. Um, compared to previous years, where actually that's often our busiest time of the year, coming up to the end of tax year. We just found that actually it's been the, it was the quietest tax year end we've had since we started the business. Yes. Um, however, there then seemed to be almost another change of mindset once we'd got beyond that time. So once we were into sort of late March and beyond, where people have, again, gross generalisation, I realise, that people who were almost saying, well, actually we're, we're just going to carry on. There is no point putting things off anymore. And certainly the conversations I've had with people who run other businesses in different sectors and so on, I've, I've all alluded to a similar type of story. I don't know if mm. that's commonplace in the people you're speaking with. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and in, in all, all, all cross sectors as well. Uh, and I think 
perhaps uh, which has uh, something to do with it, uh, and I know Lord Blunkett discusses this in uh, uh, the second half of this podcast, in fact, but uh, there has been a, a general uh, lack of leadership uh, politically in this country, a lot of people feel anyway. Uh, I think Britain is a fairly lucky country in that in when most times get, when times get tough, we've often had someone there that can lead. Uh, and a lot of people in a lot of sectors of the economy uh, look to their sector and they see their leaders, but they look at po- the political their sector, really, and they don't. Um, do you get that feeling as well, Colin? I, I do. Um, I think there's two things that I've probably learnt in the last... Um, yeah, based on all of this. Uh, the one is this thing that nature appalls a, back, a vacuum is true, isn't it? And it's, mm. it's true in politics, that where there is a void, then everything is rushed and sucked into it. So you, instead of having nothing, you end up with a melting pot of everything, which just causes chaos. Um, but the second thing that's been very interesting, and, and, and I'd be really interested if you were to ask any any politician this, that what I think it has actually now shown the country is what value does Parliament really offer to us Mm. in the sense of we've gone through a stage where there's been few additional laws made. We've gone through a stage where there's been very little change to the economy from a political perspective and, and influence. So essentially, the country has just got on. It's just got on carrying out trade, creating jobs, building relationships, manufacturing and so on. And it's actually done pretty well. Uh, and I, and I, actually, it's a really good indication of what what do we get from government. Um, hmm. You know, now I'm, I'm an absolute Democrat, um, but actually I think there are questions now being asked. I, I think uh, a lot of people in politics talk of a crisis. Um, I think if you go out into the country, no one is talking of a crisis apart from perhaps a crisis in Westminster. Yeah. Uh, there is... I, go on, sorry, Colin. No, 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 I would kind of agree with you, actually. I think that's been a, 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 an obvious issue that, that day-to-day people out there are working hard, they're generating income for their families, they're paying off their mortgages, um, they are getting on with their everyday lives. And the difficulty has been for business leaders uncertainty. It's yeah. if they knew the terms to which they're going to be working on, they could plan. Whether it's what they want or whether they don't want, at least they could plan. But we are just in this period where people who particularly on importing and export, which must be horrendous, are just being left in the dark. And uh, that must be really tough. I think it was an old joke 10 years ago, but famously, I think Belgium was out of government for about 600 days, and it worked all right for them, so maybe we should just give it a go. Uh, um, but um, let, yeah. let's pretend, no, let's say um, yeah, yeah, a bit dark for a moment. If you were Secretary of State for the day, and you had a magic wand, what is it you would do for the sector? Uh, what needs to be done? So there are still some aspects of regulation that really don't still seem to work. So the aspect of advice that we're involved in is well regulated and primarily seems to work very well. What seems to go wrong is product failure. So for example, you will be aware that there is an issue relating to what's called mini bonds, which is where people Mm. raise money in order to lend it out to others. And there's been some issues and failures on that. And It's the area of product development, design, and sale that seems to be where there is weakness in our regulation at the moment. And there needs to almost be um, a cap mark, if you can think back to that, or a a kite mark, where um, something is approved that is acceptable for clients to put their money into. And, And we just would love to have that security and knowledge and safety um, we generally look for things that are more risk averse, things that are safer for clients. Um, but sadly, the uh, normal retail investor who is perhaps making their own decisions is being drawn into things that, that just aren't as safe as they portrayed. And I think there needs to be greater protection for that type of uh, investor. Uh, without a doubt, I think it was only this morning, in fact, that the Treasury uh, uh, 
launch an investigation into one of those um, uh, uh, failed bond firms, uh, and not a moment too soon. Well, unfortunately, there's been people in our profession who've been flagging these up for the last three or four years, mm. and it appears to have just totally been missed somehow. And uh, my worry is that there may be still some more to come. Uh, and I just hope that we can find a way of just approving investment arrangements so that at least people can invest with more certainty and, and confidence. Do you think the uh, FCA is up to the job? Most of what it does is absolutely fine. Um, mm. And they've got a hard job. They've got to manage yes. <laughs> lots of small businesses like us, as well as big banks and um, and their financial advice arms and so on as well. So they have a very difficult role. But I do think that in the same way that we know that our medicines are approved because they've gone through NICE, mm -hmm. um, in the same way I think our investments and pension plans should be as well. Uh, because then I think that individuals can invest in them in confidence. That doesn't always mean to say they're going to get their money back because investments fall as well as rise. Yeah. But where there is something which just seems too good to be true, that's generally because it is. A, 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 a fair summation, I think. Um, and, you know, going, since your business was founded, it, it has been a, a wonderful success story. Uh, have you any guiding principles that have got you here? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, the first thing we have is our integrity is everything. Mm. Um, we've said that we're trusted, and I believe we genuinely are by our clients. So, where we do something wrong, we want to admit it straight away. We want to put things right as soon as we possibly can. But also, if we don't understand something fully, we want to be open and honest with our client and say we'll need to get some additional support rather than just fudge away through it. And the way I've generally considered this is if it's somebody of uh, a generation older than me, I always think if it was my parents who were sat on the other side of the desk, mm -hmm. what would I be advising them to do? Or if it was someone of similar age to me, what would I be advising my brother to do? Um, or if it's someone younger than me, what would I be advising my son to do? So let's just think these are real people. It's their money. It's never mine. It's always theirs. And we need to treat them with respect and give them the very best that we can possibly offer. And we have tried to do that for everyone who we've dealt with. And perhaps finally, uh, if if you had any advice, you know, to, to uh, uh, younger people, people just leaving school today, that were interested in uh, uh, joining the sector, joining the industry, what would you say to them? So I think you know it would fit very much with our education principle. Um, learn as much as you can, obtain as many qualifications as you can, um, uh, and. And don't stop reading and learning um, all the way through because actually there's always something new that we can pick up um, and always something new that you can apply to, to a client and for their benefit. And just being aware of the world and the financial world is incredibly powerful. Um, we, we were, I'll just give a very quick Please, example, yes. if you don't mind. Um, yeah, we, we took on a new client a couple of years ago, and just from my experience, I just identified an issue and said, have you had this reviewed, this particular issue, knowing that in the late 90s, there was a public review of all such plans. And he said, oh, I don't believe I have. And I said, well, contact the provider yes. and just ask them to take a look at it. In so doing, he's now heard back. It's taken quite a long time, but we've helped him through that. And he's had an uplift of £280,000 on the value of that particular oh. arrangement. Now, that's just through knowledge. Mm. That's just by being aware of something. It's just by making sure that the client is aware of something that I know of. And it's one of the things we have often said, we use our knowledge, our experience, our qualifications to help our clients. That's what they're paying for. So, yeah, that background awareness and knowledge is always useful. And I think it's a superb way to end. Colin, thank you very much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for all your questions.
I hope you enjoyed our chat there with uh, Colin. I think we all learned quite a bit about the financial sector there. And I'm certainly going to have to take up Colin's offer to visit the Phoenix Stowe Book Festival. I'm sure lots of you will as well. Coming up now is our conversation with the Parliamentary Review's co-chairman, David Blunkett. Lord Blunkett served as Home Secretary and then Education Secretary in Tony Blair's cabinet before receiving a peerage in 2015. Outside of politics, he's the Vice President of the Royal National Institute of Blind People and the National Alzheimer's Society. And when he has the time, he can be found cheering on his team, Sheffield Wednesday. I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed speaking to David. Here it is now. Uh, we're now joined by Lord Blunkett. Thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. Now, um, it would probably be remiss of me if I didn't start, given the recent events in Parliament. Um, I didn't ask you, given your 32 years in that place, about your thoughts regarding the unprecedented situation I think the public are looking at at the minute. Well, I think I see it very much like Joe Public. I see it as though I'm looking at something that is made up, that is scripted that is like a, a, a almost a sci-fi film where <laughs> anything can happen and then anything does happen. And I'm very sad about that because I think that it's damaged our parliamentary democracy. I think that it's brought politics into disrepute and I think it's created anger on all sides, whether people were strongly in favour of remaining or whether they were, as we call them, Brexiteers. Absolutely. Um, and given that situation, uh, whether it's going to be a general election, um, many people are beginning to worry about how uh, apathy taking effect. Well, I'm worried about two things. Apathy in the re respect of turnout and whether people vote, and anger and, if you like, the, the friction developed into a failure to be able to have a democratic dialogue so that the respect that we have for each other that the way in which we debate issues is often now broken down mm -hmm. and there's abuse in the street, not just of people because they're considered to be different or foreign, mm -hmm. but because people recognize they have a different point of view. Now, that is new. I've been around in, in formal politics now for, goodness, you know, almost all, all my adult life because I was mm -hmm. elected to a a local authority in my city of Sheffield when, when I was 22. And I've never seen that. I've seen people get very annoyed, and that's fine, and people should get angry. But I've never experienced them display it in such personal venom mm. before. And we need to calm that because our democracy depends on people being able to have genuine dis disagreements and differences and to work them through the political process. Otherwise, we fall, as history teaches us, into the hands of extremists. Absolutely. And, and given um, that, that you've just said what you just said, um, a lot of people are talking now about whether the party structure, which does exist at the minute, uh, it can survive. We've seen both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party showing signs of buckling. I think the political system will, the party system will survive. It, it may have a very rocky time in the near future, but I think it will write itself, but it will only do that if political parties themselves sort out what's going on internally. I think both major parties have been, to use an old phrase, infiltrated. Uh, I came across a, a, a pro prominent minister just outside the cabinet whose uh, current chair of their Conservative Association was the UKIP candidate against him back in 2015. We, we know about the challenges within the Labour Party and the way in which people who were thrown out of the party have either been able to or are seeking to rejoin. And so we've got this two-ender, if you like, the, the, the bread in uh, the two sides of the sandwich coming together and, and the middle is being squeezed. Now, there's, there's academic work to, to say that actually the electorate aren't all that keen on centre parties, particularly at the moment. Mm. Uh, and I, I think we need to be wary of believing that the creation of some sort of centrist party in Britain would solve the problem. It would temporarily, but it wouldn't resolve the differences that people have and how we work them through. A lot of people 
have been suggesting uh, recently that the only way out of this situation is with a second referendum. And I write in saying that you have quite reluctantly come to that position yourself. It took me a very long time to come to the conclusion that we would need an affirmative vote. I resisted it because I come from and represented an area deeply disaffected, feeling the effects of deindustrialization and then the austerity measures on the back of the global meltdown and felt in my bones, which is why I wasn't one of those who thought we were easily going to win the referendum for Remain in 2016, that you need to deal with the underlying problems and causes of, of that disaffection. And the simple slogan, they didn't hear you the first time, tell them again, mm. could be very effective, a kind of Trumpian slogan that could be adopted by those who are very, very vehement uh, Brexiteers. Uh, however, I think given the state that we're in, I came to the conclusion a few weeks ago, and I wrote in the Daily Telegraph, that I think the only way to deal with this is uh, to, to get an agreement for this interim period, because that's what it is, a transition mm. from where we are to where we might be, and then put that to the British people. And if the British people don't like that uh, negotiated agreement, either Theresa May's original or something that emerges from the uh, discussions and the debate and the to and fro between the two major parties, put that to the electorate and give them a chance three years on from 2016 to make a, a new choice as to whether that's what they want to go for, that's the, the direction they want to take, or whether they'd like to take a step back and remain in the European Union. And do you think that um, the people of Sheffield that did vote leave, many of whom voting for the first time in decades or the first time ever, um, do you think that they would feel maybe slightly frustrated at the call for a second vote? Yes, I think they would. And I think we just have to be really honest about that. There would be a great deal of frustration bordering on anger, people saying, we, we gave you the message, why didn't you just do it? And we have to be straight with them. The reason it's been complex, the reason it's taken this time, the reason that we are in the undoubted mess we're in, is because it wasn't simple. You didn't, as some people thought, sign a bit of paper and walk away. This is a complex, interconnected, economically, socially, uh, in terms of our trade and our rela relationships, not just within the European Union, but with the European Union's agreements across the world. This is a complex issue. And to pretend otherwise, is not to uh, give people what they want, it's to patronize them and say, yes, you, you know, we, we don't think you were wrong. We don't think that you got it wrong when you thought it was a simple way out. I think you just have to be straight with them, and they'll be angry. I mean, people are angry with me when I walk around in, in my old constituency and say, what are you up to? Mm. And I say, I'm up to trying to speak the truth. I'm up to trying to say it as it is, as I always have done. Absolutely. Now, given all of that, uh, one would expect the governing party to perhaps be somewhere between 20 points and to 30 points behind the opinion polls, but they are not. Um, and... Uh, there has been an awful lot of criticism of the leadership of the opposition regarding that. Um, would you have any advice for the leadership of your party? Well, I think belatedly, from the beginning of April, the two parties realised that they were going to sink separately if they didn't actually try and make an effort and at least display some endeavour um, to work together. I think had there been two different leaders post-2016 referendum. This would have happened a great deal earlier. It hasn't, but it can now. And it is remarkable that in the circumstances that the government have found themselves, not just in not being able to, uh, to get the kind of deal that some people wanted, but even being able to hold all their party together, but actually being totally riven publicly with cab cabinet responsibility having broken down to find themselves only marginally behind or even on opinion polls through March, marginally in front of the Labour Party is astonishing. And once this um, period is over, I think Labour will need to take a very long, hard look at why the British people have not turned, as they often do, 
to what is called Her Majesty's Opposition. Mm. Uh, there are very complex reasons for that, including the fact that uh, the leadership of the party have only realised, I think, very, very recently, that you have to reach out to people whose views you don't agree with and you have to win them over to something more um, than the, the, the issues and the policies and the ideology you thought of in the first place. Mm, and, and on that point, you'll be aware, certainly, that the parliamentary review itself has been dedicated to showcasing leadership in all its forms across the country. So they're speaking to many of our contributors, um, they have made clear that um, they do feel that leadership has been lacking, um, uh, both from the government and opposition, as you've said. Um, in your many years in politics, is there a time in certain recent history where there has been a, perhaps a leadership vacuum like we're seeing today? I think we, we find in Brit Britain a, an interesting paradox. People want strong leaders, but they want leaders that listen and are responsive. And the two don't always go together. I've lived through the period of both Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, two leaders who knew what they wanted to do mm. and were prepared to um, put it on the line. I've lived through Ted Heath and John Major, who were less clear, Ted Heath on Europe, yes, but not on much else, um, John Major really trying to mop up after the uh, controversial and divisive Thatcher era, where they showed a different style of leadership. Now, they were portrayed as being weak. I don't think that's always the case. I think that you can have leaders who are very clear what they want to do, uh, but to turn on its head the Marxist slogan, uh, speak softly and walk with a big stick. <laughs> they can actually do do the the job clearly and decisively. Clem Attlee was such a person, uh, and in, in many ways so is Harold Macmillan. And those are the kind of leaders where, where you don't get bombast, you don't get, I know best and I'm going to push this through, but you actually get uh, someone who can genuinely create a coalition of the willing that has a clear idea about their values. And I hope we'll return to that. Absolutely. And I think one of the strengths of the review has always been its sense of bipartisanship. Uh, well, that's... well, I think Parliamentary Review does something very interesting. It, it provides a, a platform for people to share and express their views, and I hope we're going to be able to build on that even more so that people can interconnect with each other. But it also gives an opportunity uh, for parliamentarians to know that people are taking interest in what they're doing and how they're doing it, and therefore to get the message that they've got to reflect outwards. We, we need both. We need the input into the system. We need voices. We need ideas. We need experiences through parliamentary review inwards. But we also need to ensure that the way in which our politics works is reflected outwards. So people firstly understand how the system works. Secondly, the complexity and difficulty of it, and thirdly, the way in which they need to tell us, I mean, I'm in the upper house now, but to tell us as parliamentarians what they think and where we're going wrong and for us to listen. Um, absolutely. And uh, on that point, you've, I mean, you've been in public service most of your life, Colonel Blunkett, ever since Sheffield City Council. I mean, in that time, what are the key lessons you think you've learned in the best way for policymakers and those on the, at the cold face to communicate and work together? I've learned that actually there is enormous wisdom out there, and if you're prepared to engage and to listen, then your views might actually change. Mine have on a number of issues, particularly social issues, what small L liberal issues over the years, going in the opposite direction, it has to be said to most people as they, as they age. Um, <laughs> And you need to, to ensure that you've reached out to sufficient people to create that coalition that allows you to make progress and that you won't create everything you want and change everything you want for the better overnight. It will never happen. There's no day where everything's done and we can all wash our hands of it. That's fine. We build building blocks. We, we stand, if you like, historically on the shoulders of those who came before us. And if we get that message... We won't be too frustrated when everything doesn't happen immediately, but we'll be 
determined to make progress and will punish politically, democratically, those who don't. Absolutely. And perhaps um, finally, with, with that concluding point, um, it's fair to say, as you've already mentioned, a lot of the population are frustrated, no matter how they vote in the referendum or their general political opinions. But perhaps, you know, for those people, is there something you'd point to to be optimistic uh, looking towards the future about? I think I'm very clear. We're a great nation. We can't just do things on our own. We have to recognise that we live in a an incredibly rapidly growing global environment and the power sources of and the power um, politically has changed over the last 20, 30 years. But we are creative, we are innovative, and we will pull through. And we'll do it because we won't have anyone else to blame anymore if we come out of the European Union. And we'll need to pull our, literally pull our socks up and do it ourselves. In the end, my message is clear. Nothing is ever as good as it seems at the time and nothing is ever as bad. And we've come through difficult times in the past and we'll come through again. Lord Blanket, thank you very much. Thank you, John. A special thanks to our guests, Colin Lowe and Lord Blanket, for joining us today. As always, it's been a pleasure interviewing and learning from our guests, and I hope you all enjoy listening. Until next time, I'm off to the Buckingham Arms to raise a glass to raising standards. Goodbye. Thank you very much for listening to our podcast. You can find every episode on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. If you'd like to know more about the Parliamentary Review, please visit our website at www.theparliamentaryreview.co.uk.